I'm so happy to be here in this beautiful space, and I'm very happy to share this moment with you. I am a musician, a percussionist actually, and a musician's job is to create an ecology in which people can listen. Uh, sometimes we do that by means of a concert. That's the standard way that we make an ecology of listening. But there are many, many other ways in which the environment of audibility, of listening, of taking information and wisdom through the ears can arise. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We are, we have no ear lids. We have eyelids. We have ways of removing ourselves from sensory in information through practically every sense. If you don't want to look at something like that light, I could do this, I could turn away, I could close my eyes. I have a mechanical impediment to this sense that I don't want. If you don't want to touch something that's hot, you have the mechanical ability to refrain from doing that. But we don't have a mechanical ability to block out sound. And part of me wonders why that is. Why is it? What is so important about sound that nature did not give us a way of blocking it out? Now, of course, I know we can put our fingers in our ears. But if you've ever uh, you know, been in a hotel with an L train running outside, just like in the Blues Brothers, it doesn't really work. We take sound in through our ears, we take it through our bodies, we take it through the soles of our feet. If we can't hear it with our ears, we hear it with something else. And there are, I think there are in, uh, ecological, environmental, evolutionary reasons for that. For one, every important emotional moment of life is signaled by sound. If you wish to propose to the person of your dreams, I would suggest that you not send a text I would suggest you perhaps whisper in their ear. If you wish to keep somebody from walking out in front of traffic, don't just wave your arms, shout. So when it's important, when it's immediate, when it's emotional, when it connects you with other people, sound is the means by which we, uh, we communicate with one another. So, I have a particular relationship to sound. I'm, I'm a musician, but, but I'm even a stranger creature than that. I am a percussionist. A percussionist, oh, when I was riding you know, to, on airplanes back in the old days, you know, when you used to travel all over the world and play concerts, people would say, what do you do? And I would say, well, actually, after I started conducting an orchestra, that became easier. I would say, I'm an orchestra conductor, and everybody says, oh, yeah, they have a built-in thought image. But before that time, I would say I was a percussionist, and you would get this sort of Daffy Duck look, of like, but if you didn't, what's that? And I didn't know what to say, so at a certain point, I started saying, a percussionist is defined by its word in German, Schlagzeug. Schlag means to strike, and Zeug means stuff. A percussionist is an artist who hits stuff. And it's the quality of that stuff and the nature of that hitting that makes it art. And so we have these two forces to come, that come together. One is my general interest in sound. And secondly is the profession, the vocation that I've chosen, the art I've developed since I've been, oh, I don't even remember, five or six years old. And that is, as a musician in particular, a percussionist. So my job, in a way, is to merge those two things. Sometimes that happens in a concert. Sometimes it happens in an environment like this when we're listening to one another. So one of the things that a musician needs to be able to do in order to get other people to listen, that person must also be able to listen themselves. And you would be surprised how, how many musicians have only ever learned how to listen to music and not to the world itself. But for a very, very long period of time, I have thought that my art was the key to the door to the sounds of the rest of the world. When I was a kid on the farm, as you, as you mentioned, um, we would hear, I would hear the wind whistling around the corners of our North Iowa farmhouse. You know, in the winter, a direct express from the Arctic Circle. And my mother, who was an amateur pianist, would play Chopin downstairs. So to me, the sounds of Chopin and the sound of the wind are inextricable from one another. It was always environmental. My grandparents lived on a lake. And some of you who have visited a northern lake know that there's a certain day in the spring when the ice comes out. 
you know, when the warm southwesterly wind brings the, the, just enough heat to melt the ice, and gradually across this lake, the ice would break up and would be pushed against the north shore of the lake where they lived, and I would sit outside of my grandparents' house, and I would hear an ice wind chime that was miles long and several hundred uh, yards wide. And that sound, and I remember thinking to myself, why isn't this music? And only later did I realize that it always had been music. All I needed to do was to listen to it like a musician. So as I said, my, uh, my goal is to merge those two things. Now, we can tell an enormous amount about the world by what we, just what we hear. We, are, we forget this, right? Because we are so glued to our, our devices. We are sitting on our phones all the time. We are texting. Instead of listening, we are texting. We are looking at things all the time. And you know, it's like Marvin Gaye said, you know, believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. So we have figured out somehow that we trust our eyes, our devices, and not our ears. And what I've discovered is that you can tell an enormous amount about the world just by listening. We can track rates of extinction, for example. You know, sounds go extinct also, not just creatures. I think about the, the typewriter, for example. My grandmother played, uh, uh, played, <laughs> literally that's how I view it, right? She typed on an old mechanical typewriter. You could, I'd walk in the house and I'd hear the key, and she would hit those keys and it instilled fear in the hearts of all of us grandchildren. And that's my grandmother's sound. My mother had an electric typewriter. It was smooth, it was slick, it was fast, it was rhythmic. That was my mother's sound. They are both gone, and so is the typewriter. So we, we, we track our, our, our pathway through the world by what sounds come to us and what sounds disappear. Now, I am extraordinarily proud of my association with the University of California in San Diego. Joining the faculty of UCSD was the second best decision I made in my life. The first best decision is sitting right over there, Brenda June. And, and, get, and, I'm, and I'm proud to go on campus and see the growth, the new buildings, et cetera. I love it. And I wonder what we're losing. When you build something, something it, it takes something away. So what used to be there? What is the habitat that's no longer there? What's being replaced? And when I was first on campus, 32 years ago, you would hear the sound of air, of wind, through the eucalypts, around the corners of buildings, things like that. Now you hear the sound of air handling. And so we can chart our pathway through the world, both by what we hear and what we no longer hear. So if you just imagine to yourself right now, what are those sounds that to you are now extinct? Think right now, what are they? Is it the hiss of vinyl? Is it the ding of a slide projector when you were in grade school advancing something? Is it the voice of someone you loved who's no longer here? My mother, for example, I don't really remember her voice. I know what she looks like, I can see pictures, but I've lost her voice. So we can chart our pathway through the, through the world this way. Um, I did this experiment. Uh, this is now 15 years ago. And I'll, I'll, by the way, I'll invite you to continue to think about sound. And I invite you when you leave this space to listen to the world in perhaps a more acute way. So I had this thought. I wondered whether or not I, as a trained musician, might have any kind of leverage, any sort of enhanced understanding of the ecology of sound because of my years of, of, of musical training. So I thought I was taking a trip to listen, and I decided I would walk to listen because if you're in a device, if you're in a machine, that machine already makes sound, right? And so you can't separate yourself from the sound. John Cage would say, by the way, that we also make sound. If you go to an anechoic chamber, you will hear the sound of your heartbeat, and you will hear the sound of your nervous system, which in my particular case is quite loud. And, uh, and so we also bring our sounds with us, right? So I decided to walk from San Diego to San Francisco to listen to the sound of the, of the Pacific Coast. I asked myself, what can I find out about where I am 
and what my place here is by simply listening. So I walked um, without uh, a device in my hand. I mean, for much of that, that trip, you can't get reception in any event. And I just listened. What I was also doing, as it turns out, was walking to propose to Brenda. I didn't realize that as I was doing it, but as I was walking, I realized, oh, I know what I'm doing. I lived in San Diego. She lived in San Francisco. I walked to ask her to marry me. Now, you know, when you're 15 and you want to express some serious emotion, you know, you can give a book of poetry or a, a Hallmark card. I was 53. I was old enough to know better. But I set out thinking that this level of commitment should be reinforced by a gesture that was more than just a, you know, a text or something like that. And so very much in the footsteps of John Muir, I started at the Mexican border, and I walked to the Hotel Del Coronado for lunch the first day. Uh, that normally on long treks is not. You don't get a first class meal for lunch on the very first day. And day after day after day, foot after footfall after footfall, I walked up the coast. And I heard the sounds of our world circa 2006. I heard what Camp Pendleton sounds like, as different from San Diego. Camp Pendleton is what California actually is, right? Scrubby plants, chaparral, dry, sounds of snakes, sounds of wind, sounds of the, you can hear the ocean from an enormous distance when you're in that environment. I heard Los Angeles. And I heard uh, fr from a street corner 15 different languages being spoken at the same time. In the middle of the seemingly endless immigration debate, I could hear the sound of the world that was trying to cope with that. I heard what the Big Sur coast was like when you make those, those 500 foot uh, long uh, rises and falls over the hills, and at the top you hear the birds and the wind, and at the bottom you hear the ocean. And it was like somebody had a fader every two hours. The wind was there, and then replaced by the waves, etc. I heard what San Francisco sounded like, and I heard it by having walked 750 miles, not flown into SFO. And so it became this, this moment at which I thought, we know something is happening, right? Something probably not great for somebody. And so I realized that at this moment, I needed to listen to the world. And that's what I've done ever since. And I have now a catalog of uh, observations and of sort of poetic associations. And I both bring those poetic associations into my music making, and I use my skills as a musician to listen more intently to the world. And they've become this beautiful reinforcing ecology of listening and living. So um, I don't have very much time. I would love to talk to you for a, a long time about what happened on the world and the road. By the way, can I just interrupt myself? The motorcycle is fantastic. <laughs> Sound is value neutral, which is, which is the same thing as saying, you love the sound of your Harley more than your neighbors. So it all is contextual. We provide the ear lids to the sound. I'm going to play, with whatever time I have left, an excerpt from a wonderful piece by the American composer Frederick Zhebsky, whom we lost just this last year. It's a piece called To the Earth. And it's a setting of a Homeric hymn. So uh, we don't know exactly who wrote the Homeric hymns. Homer, is, in fact, is a little bit of a mystery to us exactly uh, what, who or what that person was. We think that this were the, fo the followers of Homer sometime slightly in a couple of hundred years later. But in any event, this, the text is, is nearly 3,000 years old. It is about the beauty of the earth. And it is played on four earthenware uh, for flower pots. These are just ordinary flower pots. You just pick them up at a, in fact, the, the composer says, buy them locally and try not to spend more than $5. This is a composer who has never shopped in La Jolla. <laughs> you have to spend more money than that. Um, and I'll just tell you a brief story, and then I'm going to play the piece for you, and I'll stop whenever I run out of time. In a, in a difficult moment of my life, and since I've told you about my mother, it was actually really in her final days, uh, I will tell you that that was the, the source of the difficulty. I was touring with this piece, and it's a wonderful piece because, you know, it's four flower pots. You can buy them wherever you are. You don't need to fly with them. You know, this, is, this is the easy piece, right? And I was playing in Wilmington, North Carolina, and like I do today, I had some spares there just in case something breaks. They're, by the way, remarkably resilient, and they really... 
They make a sort of really beautiful, pure, pure tone. But for some reason, this top one cracked. And I had a, a spare right here, but I decided not to replace it. And I simply went up the scale, and when I got to the top note, it went like that. And all of a sudden, I could feel the metaphor settle onto the room, that these are unbelievably resilient instruments made of earth, but when they're broken, they're broke, and they don't come back. And so people thought, oh, right, that is also our relationship with the planet these days. And so this, to me, is the beauty, the poetry, and the metaphor of this piece. I'd like to play for you uh, an, at least an excerpt um, from the uh, piece by Frederick Shevsky called To the Earth. The, the text is a Homeric hymn, and I hope, you, I hope you enjoy it. And if we can't hear it because of a Harley, my point has been made. To the earth, mother of all, I will sing the well established. The oldest who nourishes on her surface everything that lives. those things that walk upon the holy ground and those that swim in the sea and those that fly. All these are nourished by your abundance. It is thanks to you if we humans have healthy children and rich harvests. Great Earth, you have the power to give life to and to take it away from creatures that must die. Happy are the ones whom you honor with your kindness and gifts. What they have built will not vanish. Their fields are fertile, their herds prosper, and their houses are full of good things. Their cities are governed with just laws. Their women are beautiful, good fortune and wealth follow them. Their children are radiant with the joy of youth. The young women, the young women play. The young women play in the flowery meadows. 
dancing with happiness in their hearts. Holy Earth, undying spirit, so it is with those whom you honor. Hail to you. Mother of life. You who are loved by the starry sky, Be generous and give me a happy life. In return for my song, so that I can continue to praise you with my music. Thank you.